Welcome to Longevity and Aging series. Today, I would like to introduce to you John um, Berner. John is a board certified psychiatrist in solo practice at Woodenville with 27 years of experience. He is committed to promoting innovative treatments, and his research interests are neural network stability with nonlinear internal feedback, neuropsychiatric consequences of altered cetazolic acid sensing, clinical characteristics of ketamine responders in pain and depression, and neuropsychiatric toxicity of drugs with mitochondrial targets. Dr. Berner uh, recently published a paper titled mTOR cultivation in presumed classical monocytes, absurd correlation with human size variation and neuropsychiatric uh, diseases. Uh, but before we start discussing the paper, John, uh, could you please tell us more about your background and uh, how you became interested in the topic? Sure. So I'm a practicing psychiatrist. I was always interested in uh, psychiatric disease as related to metabolism rather than necessarily cell surface signaling, giving, given personal experience prescribing lithium, you know, because lithium is a glycosin synthase kinase inhibitor that presumably affects every cell in the body. And yet it has such a powerful effect in classical bipolar patients. And what's looking to be very true in terms of Alzheimer's and other dementia pro prophylaxis. So there's this concept that tissue is not defined by its cell surface activity, but is actually defined by the metabolism which underlies its function. And that's a really powerful concept. So I've always been interested in this area. And then in 2007, I started prescribing ketamine and have done a lot of the original work in that area. And it became clear with experience that the effect of ketamine on a daily usage for many people is related to its central anti-inflammatory effects. So ketamine almost certainly changes the equilibrium distribution in the brain between the type 1 microglia, the pro-inflammatory microglia, and the M2C microglia, whose promoters are typically IL-10 and corticosteroids and are related to extracellular matrix modulation. And ketamine's been a major advance in psychiatry, probably our biggest advance in the last 20 years. Um, there's an article in The Lancet describing 400 patients randomized to IV ketamine and ECT who failed traditional therapies and the response rate to ketamine is 55%. I mean, that's amazing across all branches of medicine that we have something that's this potent. And so given that we have an effective treatment, how can we make it work better? How can we do dose finding? How can we uh, improve patient selection? And that means we need to focus on the metabolism associated with the microglia. And obviously doing brain biopsies in humans is challenging to say the least. So we're left with the available tissue, which is the monocyte fraction in the blood, it's not a perfect fraction because uh, for all sorts of reasons. I mean, number one, tissue resident macrophages in the brain, the microglia come from the, the yolk sac and the embryo, and they are different tissues than the monocyte derived tissue resident macrophages. Um, and so, that's a problem. And then the other problem is, is that most of the monocyte fraction in the blood is actually stem cell. You know, it comes out undifferentiated. And so, you know, it's not going to be easy to really focus in on what we're interested in, which is the M2-like uh, tissue resident macrophage population in the blood. Uh, there is an M2 macrophage population. It is uh, designed to repair the endothelial cells in the, uh, in the arteries, you know, from turbulent flow, from hypertension, and from other sorts of issues. So colony stimulating factor actually can induce the stem cell uh, monocyte that's floating around in the blood to become a tissue resident macrophage. 
And I think that's the theoretical idea behind the paper, which is, mm -hmm. can we, with the grossest of assays, you know, essentially we take a, a, a white blood, the Buffy code fraction from the blood and look at a differentiated cell, a non-stem cell, and look at that gross assay and correlate it with our clinical population and say, hey, is there information here that is potentially useful for clinical management? And really to our surprise, I mean, this is the most pilot study you could possibly imagine. Very small sample sizes, you know, very few readouts. We actually saw findings that are consistent with the known biology and have been replicated with other with other groups. So, you know, essentially the study was is we took uh, Buffy coat samples from thirty women who are in a psychiatric clinic. I mean, so these are not normal controls; these are clinical cl clinical samples, and we looked at surrogate measures of TOR activation in that population, which would be phosphorylation of S6 kinase. And then we looked at how that sort of related to the phenotypic landscape in this population. And what did we see? One thing we saw, which we thought was extremely interesting, is that the phenotypic uh, concept of macrocephaly, you know, pupil distance and head circumference uh, correlated with S6 kinase phosphorylation. And this has been described uh, in animal models of P10 knockouts, where you see constitutive activation of TORC1 throughout a lifetime, you know, that these animals tend to have very large heads. And if you use antisense RNA, you can reverse only to TORC1, not to TORC2. You can reverse the macrocephaly. And so we had some previous unpublished clinical data that suggested head circumference was a predictor of ketamine response. And this was sort of our, if you will, positive control. And uh, we saw this and we said, oh my gosh, there's so many ways to very reliably critique our lab technique, but we have a positive control in even a small sample size. And so that provided us with a lot of confidence. We were seeing what we were hoping to see. Um, and when you say um, positive control, it means like you, you see some confirmation that there is an tor uh, TORC1 activation in the blood. Uh, right. So in other words, the TORC1 inflammation elevation is not unique to the monocyte fraction. It's a gain of function distribution within every cell in the body because it shows up as macrocephaly in this population. But in this paper, uh, you said you, you just cited, uh, does it mean that uh, activation of mTOR uh, is coming from nutrient sensing? or there is um, some immune-related signaling which leads to white blood cell uh, activation of mTOR. Okay, so I think the concept is, is that everything in biology is Gaussian, right? And we all live in a gradient. And there are people who are born with constitutive increased mTORC1 activation for all sorts of reasons. And there are people who are born with decreased mTORC1 TORC1 activation for all sorts of reasons. And one of the phenotypic manifestations of elevated TORC1 activation is macrocephaly, right? Is, is having a, a large head relative to the rest of the body. And that so, seems, to be, seems to be strongly implied by the studies looking at P10 knockouts in rodents that macrocephaly is a phenotypic variant of constitutive mTORC1 activation. Mm -hmm. So basically, the idea is then that uh, this patient with um, a depression in, in, in your paper, they have somehow 
a high activation of mTOR, but this may be due to some constitutive act increased activity of mTOR, which is reflected throughout the, body, throughout the body. Right. It may not just be in micro in 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 a myeloid population whether the myeloid population be the bone marrow derived macrophage or whether the myeloid population be the embryonic yolk sac tissue reg tissue regulant tissue resident self renewing population in the brain it may be throughout the entire body you know if if you see activation of mtor higher activity of mtor in blood cells the same happens in all other cell types uh well right it's it's cited in the paper the p10 rodent knock the rodent knockout paper you know so if if this was a tissue specific finding we wouldn't expect correlation with head size but we mm -hmm. did and it was even in a relatively small sample mm -hmm. which is really you know i thought quite interesting mm -hmm. right? okay cool and and then you basically um measure an activity of mtorc in um, white blood cells and want to predict ketamine response, right? Right, and and what we saw in general is that the more readout of TOR, you know, phosphorylated S6 kinase, the more likely you are going to see a ketamine response. Okay. But can you define in uh, what what do you call ketamine response? Because oh, it's simple. It's a binary issue. Do patients want to take ketamine? Mm -hmm. Right. So when you work in a clinical setting for people with chronic depression, it's routine for them to try five, 10, 15 agents in order for them to see if they can, can improve their depression. And it's really a, just a sequential sampling problem. It's a search problem. Mm -hmm. And so people simply don't take drugs that don't provide them benefit. You know, this in is... this case, um, by by saying they want to take ketamine, it means they want to take ketamine after three doses, after two doses, after ten doses. This would be sustained over a period of months. Okay. Okay. This isn't a short-term placebo trial. This is, you know, in general, when you give people in a randomized trial, these are six-week trials because the placebo effect lasts for three weeks, and then you, and then it goes away. Mm -hmm. You know, but in clinical practice, what you find is is that there's a there's a binary decision point. You know, this drug clearly helps me. I'm going to, you know, pay to go to the pharmacy every three months mm -hmm. to take a drug because I'm finding benefit. Mm -hmm. And and patients simply don't take drugs that don't work. Mm -hmm. I mean, not not over periods of months. I mean, placebo effects are one thing, but that's that's not what we're dealing with here. Mm -hmm. And then basically you used all this physical um, size measurements and uh, phosphorylated uh, uh, S6 uh, kinase to predict ketamine response, right? And right. you used uh, a random forest algorithm for that. That's correct. And And again, this is a very small sample size. You know, I obviously we're going to need a lot of high quality, expensive clinical work, you know, to expand on this paper. I mean, we, you know, we did this on a shoestring and, you know, this is clearly pilot data. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, what's encouraging is when we look at some of the other studies, I mean, what are you looking at? You know, it looks like Steele's disease which is chronic inflammation, you know, chronic imbalance in the M1 pro-inflammatory tissue resident macrophage population versus the reparative M2 macrophage population that, you know, this to some degree, this defines this problem. You know, if your tissue resident cells are trapped in a glycolytic, uh, inflammatory phenotype, you're not going to be able to induce the torsi 2 fatty acid oxidation, you know, reparative and, and trophic 
tissue resident macrophage population. And there's lots of roads to roam on this issue. It's This isn't a one gene, one, one disease phenotype knockout. This is a, a vector of forward and backward rate constants, you know, which affect the the population distributions mm. of these different tissue resident macrophage populations. Um, I just came across some COPD literature that did exactly the same protocol. I mean, it's almost exactly the same. And they found the same finding in individuals with COPD that the individuals that had upregulated phosphorylated S6 kinase had, with COPD had much higher levels than the normal controls. So this may be relevant in, in disorders other than simply depression, you know, but, but all sorts of issues related to tissue repair and barrier defense rather than simple mm -hmm. just depression but basically for this particular paper uh, the way you interpret this is that um, there is some uh, differentiation of uh, monocytes and uh, tissue resident macrophages uh, related on mTOR activation mTOR1 activation right right and uh, like, can you tell more about the the function of this uh, tissue resident macrophages in brain? Does it mean that basically uh, they cross uh, blood uh, brain blood barrier and uh, become uh, will, uh, do they become M one or M two uh, subpopulation? And what is the role of these macrophages? Oh yeah, no, this is a great question, right? We don't want. In the ideal world, you don't want the monocyte fraction to cross into the brain because the monocyte fraction, if it crosses into the brain, is it recruited only in the context of severe tissue damage. And it's going to have epigenetic imprinting and it'll take months to years to respond to niche signals and become the phenotypic equivalent to the tissue resident embryonic macrophage. You know, so it's really dangerous to have recruitment of the monocyte fraction into the brain because it may take a long time for you to hit your normal distribution. I mean, this is the problem with things like recurrent head injuries and encephalitis is the, the restorative population is there all the time. And its job is to digest synapses you know, the, the m2a population is phagocytic right so its job is to digest synapses that are senescent you know presumably you know they have some i mean as a as a concept you know they have mitochondrial damage and they're putting out too many damage associated molecular patterns they're saying hey this synapse is sick digest it and then the M2C population is supposed to repair the extracellular matrix. So there's room for new memories to form within the brain. And this process is happening dynamically during sleep, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of learning that goes on during the day. The blood flow to the brain increases by 30% over the day as you learn new things and your synaptic density increases and your synaptic arbor grows. But then in order to avoid, you know, an overgrowth syndrome in the brain, you have to edit the hard drive and the restorative M2 macrophages in the brain, the M2 microglia, that's their job, right? And when that doesn't work, you get Alzheimer's disease, right? So, you know, 50% of the defects in Alzheimer's disease are known to be defects in tissue resident microglia. You know, it's not necessarily simply a synaptic disease. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a disorder of tissue repair in 50% of the genetic loading. Sorry, but what, what, what percent of this microglia is uh, like obtained from, you know, during embryogenesis or after that? And uh, what percent coming from blood when you talk about adults? 
Okay, so I, I don't do the original research in that area, but my my sense is if you do the fate mapping data and you you'd I, that's not my level of expertise is mm -hmm. all of it is embryonic you know in the ideal situation without brain injury your mm -hmm. stem cell population is you know there's a, a a unique bone marrow in the brain with a myeloid component that is there over a lifetime Okay, but when we man, when, when we measure activation from mTOR, it means uh, we think that uh, you know when you say that uh, some amount of the smaller sites uh, differentiate and become tissue resident macrophages, uh, does it mean that they go from blood through uh, brain blood barrier? No, the tissue resident macrophage, the tissue resident macrophage in the blood is designed to repair the endothelium mm -hmm. right so if you have a defect in tissue repair in the endothelium you develop atherosclerosis i'm just trying to connect because your finding yeah. is that you you basically measure network activity in the blood right but yes. when you talk about depression and when you're trying to talk about microglia uh, effects so basically you oh. you don't measure microglia effects you measure network activation in the blood so how is it related to the ketamine so the, the assumption the in microglial effect? The assumption is that the source code, you know, the metabolic gain of functions in the tissue resident microglia, I mean the tissue resident macrophage in the blood, which is repairing the endothelium, mm -hmm. is similar to the source cord gain of function to the microglia mm -hmm. heritage gain of function. You know, that they share a, a common uh, metabolic tendency, mm -hmm. you know, because they're closely related. They're not exactly the same, right? The niche, the niche signals from the endothelium are different than the niche signals from the neurons and the astroglia. Mm -hmm. So they're not exactly the same. But they share a lot of commonalities in terms of their damage-associated molecular pathway processes, you know, their excretory profiles. You know, they're they're about as similar as we're going to get, other than doing a brain biopsy. Mm -hmm. Well, basically, my question is about like we see some correlation, right? But uh, is there any causative link? Like, how can we interpret this? Or is just basically we just found some correlation or prediction, but we don't really know the mechanism of like how mTORC1 activation and white blood cells can actually, you know, explain the sure. fact. Oh, the no, no, no. So, so it's all, remember, it's all physical chemistry, right? Cells are just bags of chemicals, right? They have forward rate constants and backward rate constants. So if TORC1 is too activated, by definition, a tissue resident macrophage is going to be in the pro-inflammatory state. And it's not going to be in the torsi 2 reparative high fatty acid oxidation state. You're going to have a different population distribution. I mean, that's just that's just physical chemistry. These are equilibrium distribution. So if you're seeing too much torsi 1 by definition, potentially you're seeing too little torsi 2 in, you know, complete cell differentiation. In other words, the, the fully differentiated monocyte is an M2. You know, it has high levels of fatty acid oxidation, lots of processes that are extending out and monitoring the integrity of the local environment. You know, and, and they do they do surveillance of the local tissue by mm -hmm. sending out these processes that follow purine gradients, at least in the brain, you know, looking for, looking for local cell damage. That's the differentiated monocyte or the differentiated, fully differentiated tissue resident macrophage. When you become inflamed, you de-differentiate. You, you go back to the glycolytic form, which is mTORC1 mediated. And you excrete a lot of inflammatory cytokines. 
Okay, so basically what you what what it, the way we can interpret this potentially is that this patient have high level of inflammation. Yes. And yeah. uh, basically that's why we, like if you see the higher level of inflammation in the patients with depression, we could expect a better response for ketamine uh, because because why? Because ketamine because ketamine activates forces the, the ketamine is a central anti-inflammatory agent mm -hmm. you know in in tissue experiments and to some degree in in vitro as well in vivo as well ketamine induces tissue resident macrophages to move from an m1 phenotype or from a stem phenotype an m0 into an m2c phenotype mm -hmm. and it decreases the equilibrium distribution of the m1 phenotype so from clinical practice, you know, many neural, many rheumatologists will look for markers of systemic inflammation, C-reactive protein or SED rates. And they'll say, hey, look, you know, you're clearly inflamed. The argument that we're making is, is that you can see the inflammation actually within the, the tissue resident macrophage population. And that predicts whether or not you're going to have central inflammation. Mm -hmm. So if you see inflammation within the tissue resident macrophage population in the blood, it's going to predict that you also have central inflammation in the brain mm -hmm. and that you're going to respond to ketamine. Okay. No. So the, the concept is ketamine is not a classical psychiatric drug. It's not an upper or a downer, mm -hmm. right? It's actually an anti-inflammatory. So, but, but, uh, what we know about the effect of ketamine on neural system, because my understanding about ketamine when I when I read it uh, was that it it affects uh, uh, inhibitory gabinergic um, interneurons. Right. right. Well, this uh, is this is the theory. Well, ketamine binds a lot of places, right? And so what everyone has noticed is that when ketamine binds the NMDA receptor on the parvalpumin positive inner neurons, you get a disinhibition syndrome in the frontal lobe and patients report these deliriums and sort of, you know, psycho, uh, you know, psychoactive experiences. Mm -hmm. the, the problem with the dogma is that it's simply not true. You know, that you can treat patients with ketamine and cause absolutely no subjective delirium and no subjective increases in firing rates. And they have a very profound clinical response. And I think this fits with the idea that the NMDA receptor is ketamine's binding a lot of places in the brain. Mm -hmm. And there may be some people that respond to the disinhibition pulse, and I can go into that, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion. But there's a high proportion of patients, maybe even dominant, that the central effect of ketamine is on microglia. And this has been known in the chronic pain world for 25 years. I mean, people get ketamine comas in Mexico where they're unconscious for 24 hours or people get hour-long infusions for chronic regional pain syndrome, and they have a very good response to ketamine, and it's completely unrelated to the dissociative effect. So I think psychiatry has gotten stuck in this concept of parvel human positive response. Um, they may be orthogonal processes, mm -hmm. right? And we didn't talk about that in the paper. Thank you very much. It's, it's making it much clearer now. To me, at least, and um, what what are, what are going to do in future? Uh, are you going to design a bigger study involve more patients? Uh, we're kind of pivoting into the rapamycin world, you know, because um, it's a little bit easier to find people to check our work. Mm -hmm. uh, I find the ketamine world in the psychiatry setting to be really uh, to some degree an intellectual wasteland. Everyone's stuck with, with the concept of cell surface signaling and microglia is still 
you know, just this tiny flicker of interest in the psychiatry mm -hmm. world. I, I don't see a lot of interest in this area. Whereas the rapamycin world, you know, it's very popular, a lot of um, flexible thinkers. And so we're trying to work hard in coming up with a way of understanding the combination of ketamine and rapamycin. Since ketamine's inducing M2Cs and rapamycin's inducing M2As, and then both of these drugs are inhibiting M1s. And so we really have an equilibrium distribution of three populations. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the M1, the M2A, the M2C, they're all in confrontation with each other. How do you do patient selection in this three-dimensional landscape? How do you do dose finding in this three-dimensional landscape? I mean, there's not a lot of folks out there who are able to put the resources together to do the high quality scientific work we'd like to do. Mm -hmm. That's that's just sort of getting the word out that this is an important area and waiting for the community to coalesce in this area. Sounds great. Um, so let's maybe quickly talk about limitations of the study. Uh, you, you mentioned one of the limitations is uh, that it's done on females, but basically what what do you see the effects on males would be? Right, and males, you know, we, I think the recent uh, men and women clearly have different gain of functions in their basic tissue macrophage activity. I mean, males are more, I think, related to tissue repair associated with with dominance battles, TNF alpha mediated, and women are more maybe interferon modulated in terms of uh, fetus defense during pregnancy. You know, a virus infection during pregnancy is a problem. Mm -hmm. And so it's not surprising you see pretty radical differences in the immune system between males and females. Mm -hmm. And you know, as someone who's a psychiatrist, I mean, this is such a rich area. It's going to be hard for me to really sketch out for other individuals about how to approach this issue. But that's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. I think the other problem is, is we wanted to do more than one tissue type. We were planning on doing uh, buccal tissue as, as well. And we just didn't have the resources from our, our basic lab, you know, from mm -hmm. um, a Latin group to do the confirmatory mm -hmm. studies across multiple tissue types. Well, I think and, that, ob that obviously would be useful. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one of the limitations is that we really don't know, well, it's a kind of speculation that it works on monocytes because in the paper it wasn't shown clearly, right? Oh, so yeah. Oh, absolutely. We really, we really need, so I think the, the next step would be selecting, uh, maybe using cytometry, uh, so yeah, we'd have to get, and we'd to have to get, right. we'd, have, we'd have to gate with this, and you know, and that's very expensive, and that's yeah, you know that to some degree that's both beautiful from a scientific perspective, but also perilous from a a rapid consumer adoption perspective. You know what? But ultimately, what we want is something really cheap and really easy to get. Mm -hmm. You know, so that we can we can put this out for patient use as fast as possible. You know, because the big the big science problem is just such a huge problem, right? We have these beautiful data that's replicated, but there's only five or ten groups around the world that have the money to do this expensive gating mm -hmm. technologies, and then it takes another five years to get it replicated. It takes another five years to get it replicated. And everybody's completely confident about it, but by the time we have that confidence, nothing gets done. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of making this argument, hey, sometimes a little bit of noisy data is really good because you can replicate it with a thousand people rather than five five groups. And and I, I think there's something to be said for that. You know, yeah. do we want to replicate with really clean data or do we take terrible data and just bootstrap it yeah 
No, obviously, simple tests uh, would work better, like for this kind of um, investigations. Well, Dr. Burns, thank you very much for uh, providing insights and explanation uh, for this paper. It's it's cool that uh, uh, we now have more uh, advanced techniques to predict ketamine response, and hopefully, it will be in fast speed development soon. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Uh, Thank you very much. All the best. Bye.